So we will try to entertain you because we'll be heading to the after party next. And we also will have some uh, music. So uh, yeah, we'll see how, how it uh, work out in the end. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Maciej Piotrowski, and today I will be presenting with uh, Dominik Cygalski. Uh, and we'll be talking about locating the Yeti. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I am, of course, an iOS developer. And actually, I moved to Singapore in August. Uh, on the last talk, we've seen a lot of BBs, right? Martin has showed us. And actually, I work for BBM, uh, which is a messaging application. And I've been writing some Swift and Objective uh, C code for the past years. Uh, I also run a blog called Swifting.io. Today, uh, I'll be speaking with Dominic, as I said uh, before. Uh, actually, he doesn't know much about iOS, nor he has any iPhone. But he's a full stack developer, and uh, he works for a company called Smooth, which is uh, a car sharing startup here in Singapore. And he also has experience in data mining. So this is Dom. And uh, we are presenting this topic today, topic, uh, today to you because uh, uh, together, uh, because we are friends since kindergarten. <laughs> so if you want to know which boys on this picture uh, are ourself, uh, ourselves, uh, we are here. Yeah, this is me, this is Dom. Uh, we were quite cute boys, weren't we? And, uh, but it's not only the kindergarten that connected us. It's actually also uh, our passion, passion for snowboarding. So uh, it might be an exotic term in Singapore, but <laughs> snowboarding, <laughs> uh, snowboarding, snowboarding uh, is considered to be an extreme winter sport. But you can experience uh, something similar to snowboarding by uh, going to Sentosa Island, to the wave house, where you can surf on, on an artificial uh, wave. OK, to put some more light on the topic of snowboarding, I will play a movie. And hopefully, some, uh, the music output will work correctly. Let's see about it. No, it doesn't play the music, the, the sound, but. Yeah. OK, so when you, uh, when you go to the mountains uh, in the winter, usually wear your snowboarding equipment, and you can uh, ride down the mountain with your snowboard. You can also uh, enjoy some views at the top of the mountain. This is, f uh, for example, Mont Blanc in France. Uh, you also uh, go up uh, to the top of the mountain by using a ski lift. You can ride down the mountain slope uh, on a fresh snow powder. You can also record a movie from your trip. Uh, yeah, and you can basically enjoy uh, your whole day uh, by working out. Whoa! What had happened? I got injured. Things are getting serious. <laughs> so imagine. Uh, Imagine mountains, snow everywhere, and actually nothing else everywhere. I remember my first days at snowboard. Uh, actually, I got injured. <laughs> I had an arm injury, and until now, my arm just uh, gets off the joint from time to time. Uh, but how would I someone help if I experienced uh, such, a, such an issue over there? How would I describe my location in the mountains? and pass that information to search and rescue uh, guys. I think Yeti can help. And actually, I don't mean this creature coming from Himalaya mountains, you know, the Bigfoot. Actually, I mean uh, the Yeti project. And in 2011, I was studying electronics and telecommunications at Politecnico di Torino in Italy. And I was there with my friend, Michal Wojtyszak, uh, he also runs the blog, Swifting.io, with me. And as you can see from the photo, he is also a geek because he goes to the mountains with his uh, telephone and do some programming with it, probably. So in, we had this uh, idea 
for an application for skiers and snowboarders, and we called it Yeti. And this application would allow user to use uh, its safety features uh, to someone help. And we also wanted to provide some gamification aspects to the application that would uh, enhance one, uh, snowboarders or skiers stay in a ski resort. Actually, thanks to this project, I uh, started learning how to program uh, applications for mobile devices. And for us, Yeti uh, was uh, an acronym, and it stands for Your Emergency Tracking Interface. Quite a nice name, right? OK, so this talk is supposed to be about location. So let's focus on locating the Yeti on iOS. Or rather, should I say, locating a snowboarder with Yeti. So on iOS, we have a few opportunities uh, for uh, locating a user. Uh, we can extract some information about location by tapping into a few frameworks, such as core location, core motion, and core telephony. Let's start with core location. Usually every point on Earth can be described in terms of geographic coordinates, coordinates such as latitude and longitude. How can we obtain this position on iOS? Nothing easier. Let's write this Yeti application, or at least some parts of it. So let's write a class called Yeti Finder, and we will uh, use a location manager object coming from a uh, skill location. Uh, core location framework. So let's create an instance of our location manager. We can set some uh, properties on this object, such as uh, desired accuracy. We want to achieve the best accuracy because we will be saving people in the mountains, so better coordinates be good. We also need to set our, our class as a delegate of location manager, and uh, we need to request an authorization from a user to use uh, their location data. In order to be a delegate of location manager, we need to conform to CL location manager delegate protocol. And this protocol allows us to get information from location manager because those operations uh, are asynchronous. So let's write a method to request the location of a snowboarder. We can use it whenever somebody falls down on a slope. So we just need to uh, invoke request location method and uh, our location manager instance and we'll get the response via location manager did update locations method. So it will be passed a, an array of uh, CL location objects, and in this simple scenario, we assume there is at least one uh, object in this array, and we can use this data to pass it to safety, uh, search and rescue guys to save us. There is a typo, but do not focus with it on it. But uh, location is not, uh, Yeti is not there. So we'll be uh, seeking for Yeti in the next example. Because after all, this application is also supposed to have some gamification or gaming features. Cool. Uh, usually, we do not want to have uh, only one coordinate of a user, because user might be going moving around a ski resort or a mountain area. So uh, maybe we would like to provide a workout tracking features to our Yeti application. Uh, so let's check how we can get multiple coordinates from the location manager. So let's uh, extend our Yeti Finder class. Let's write start workout and start and stop workout method. So uh, we will need some uh, Boolean value uh, to indicate whether we are requesting one time update about location or uh, we are uh, working out and we want to collect track of one's uh, positions. And we need to invoke another uh, method, a location manager, and it's called uh, start updating location, I believe. Yeah, I wasn't wrong. That's good. And whenever we want to stop uh, getting updates about one's location, we need to call a complementary method called location manager. Uh, stop updating, updating locations. And we also can toggle our uh, variable to indicate workout tracking. And again, we'll get updates about, location, uh, about locations 
uh, in this very method that was presented in the previous example. And uh, whenever we are in a workout mode, so we are for a search of a Yeti on the slope, we would append locations to a container. So let's have a Bigfoot truck, uh, uh, Bigfoot truck array to which we will be appending uh, information about snowboarders' workout. Cool. Uh, okay, so we can also write an uh, else case about uh, getting a one-time update about location. Uh, on, uh, on iOS, we can also tap into another features of CL Location Manager, such as uh, monitoring entrances and exits to a certain region, geographical region. So let's use this feature and let's imagine somewhere in a ski resort we had a region in which Yeti would hide. Let's call it Yeti's hideout. And we can uh, ask our location manager to start monitoring this entrances and exits to this uh, region. So we need to call start monitoring for uh, method on location manager and we need to pass in this uh, geographical region which we would call hideout and we need to uh, create this hideout by creating a CL circular region object and uh, its, its parameters are the center coordinate of this region and uh, radius in which we want this region to be applicable. We also can pass in some identifier for our uh, hideout region and let's call it just Yeti's hideout. We never want to stop monitoring uh, entrances and exits to this uh, region. We just need to uh, call complementary method for simplicity. I just copy pasted the code about hideout. And we'll get updates about uh, monitoring regions via location manager that enter region. And of course, because it's a hideout, we can find a Yeti over there and uh, give to our snowboarder some points in our Yeti seeking game. And winter region requires authorization uh, to use user's location data in a background. So we might need to ask for a different set of permissions. But there's also, uh, we can also, with, with core location, we can also monitor iBeacon regions. If you don't know what an iBeacon is, it's a Bluetooth uh, low energy peripheral that continuously transmits uh, data from which it can be identified. So we could create a virtual regions, not geographical <laughs> ones. And uh, iBeacons uh, consist, iBeacons emits data packets that consist of uh, three numbers. First of them is universally unique identifier, major number, and minor number. And uh, based on those three numbers, we can identify uh, different iBeacons. <laughs> And let's imagine in our uh, ski resort, we would plant those uh, iBeacons somewhere in the bar, restaurant, or pub. So let's see how we can monitor entrances to those uh, regions, iBeacon regions. Again, we need to write some code about monitoring. We'll use the very same method on Location Manager. Let's call start monitoring. Uh, but this time, we'll pass a CL Beacon region instance. So let's create a bar, a pub, and it's, as I said, of type CL beacon region, and we need to pass in some data on which a beacon would be uh, determined, identified. Uh, this one is be, uh, this uh, beacon will correspond to Yeti's favorite pub. Uh, and we distinguish our beacons based on UUIDs. Uh, you can generate UUIDs in uh, terminal on Mac OS by using a UUID GAN tool. So I just copy pasted the string here, and whenever it's possible to create a UUID from such a string, uh, we can create the CL beacon region and start monitoring it. For simplicity, of course, again, I copy pasted my code, uh, but the only difference between start and stop monitoring pub method is that we need to call stop monitoring on location manager. And again, we'll get uh, an update about one's location uh, entrances to this region via allocation manager that enter region. Uh, and this time we have to distinguish between two different kinds of regions. 
So we have our circular region, which would correspond to our geographical hideout region. And yeah, I know it's introspection. It's because I used too much Objective-C for a while. Uh, but we also can uh, do introspection uh, and check whether regions of type CL beacon, and we can give some points to a user whenever he or she enters a certain ah. bar. Good. So imagine we were displayed on a screen those coordinates. Would you know what they mean? Yeah, I heard someone correct. <laughs> correct, yeah, correct answer. Uh, so uh, usually users don't know what coordinates mean, but we can tap into CL geocoder object uh, from CL uh, curl location. And we need to create some location with latitude and longitude, longitude, and we can reverse geocode this location by using a CL geocoder instance. So we use this reverse geocode location method. Given a location, it would return us asynchronously a CL placemark object. And after printing it out, surprise, surprise, those correspond to Nanyang Polytechnic. Good. Is there, is there any Yeti here? It's not everything we can do with core location. Uh, there is also an API called CL Visit Monitoring. So let's imagine we want to build a map of favorite spots of a snowboarder and skier in a ski resort. So whenever somebody spends some time at a certain peak or a viewpoint or restaurant or bar in our ski resort, uh, we can ask a, uh, a location manager to return us, to, be, uh, to notify us about such an uh, event. How to do that? We need to call, to call one method on Location Manager again, and this one is called Start Monitoring Visits. And if we want to stop monitoring visits, we need to call Stop Monitoring Visits correspondingly. And we will be notified about new cell visit data while Location Manager did visit uh, method and will be given CL visit object. Uh, we have on this data will come in background so we can schedule it for further processing uh, whenever application will enter foreground. But this uh, CL visit object contains such information as arrival and departure date from which we can derive the time that someone spent uh, in a certain place. We also get, of course, a uh, coordinate that might be useful to build a map of favorite spots of uh, a person. Good. Actually, core location is it the only API we can use to get uh, information about one's location. If we need to just to know, for example, from which in which country one person is currently in, we might tap into core telephony. So, you know, I experienced an injury on a slope, on a mountain slope. And uh, I was then in France. What emergency number should I call? Should I call 995? Is this an emergency number for Singapore or a different number? Uh, there is this API on core telephony. And let's write an emergency phone book. And let it be a an enum that would contain some static functions and variables. So let's create an emergency numbers uh, dictionary that would contain uh, two letter ISO country codes and emergency numbers as a values. And let's also default to some emergency number. In case of Europe, it's 112. And let's have a static function, emergency number for country code. And let it be this country code to be a string optional. And there's a reason for that. I will explain it in a moment. So uh, let's check whenever our country code is available. When it's not, just return the default number. Uh, but when we have this country code, uh, we can use it in our emergency numbers dictionary and return the val a value from this dictionary. But it might happen that it's an invalid key for our dictionary. So let's default also to a default number rather than the default number. So having this emergency phone book, we can uh, run our code uh, on an application uh, on an iPhone. And let's, get, let's have access to CT telephony network info. 
and let's extract a CT carrier object from this information uh, object. And in this carrier object, we have access to information such as mobile network code, carrier name, uh, mobile country code, and surprise, surprise, surprise uh, country code, or rather ISO country code. So we can use this value, and it's optional, and for simplicity, for simplicity we can call our emergency number uh, method function on an emergency phone book with this ISO country code, and actually I have some debug data from my a phone and it returns Singapore and number 995. Whoa, that was a bit tiring. Dom, can you help me with the next part of the presentation? <laughs> Hello, everyone. So, Dom, are we for real? Are we talking about snowboarding in Singapore? Um, yes, yes, Maciej. We're talking about snowboarding in Singapore. And that's because the inspiration for the project that we're about to talk right now actually came from Singapore. So some time ago, I stumbled upon this paper, and it was written by the people from National University of Singapore. And what they did is, yes, it's a very nice paper. And what they did is that they used the barometer sensor inside the phone to try to determine um, the transportation context of a person. In other words, they were trying to detect whether you're walking, driving a car, or you're idle, purely based on the barometer readings on your phone. And, and I found it really interesting, and at the time I didn't even know that we have barometers inside our phones. And they also point out that compared to other sensors like GPS or even accelerometer, barometer is very energy efficient. Like you can uh, run it all day and won't drain your battery, which is really good. So then immediately I thought um, we should use barometer uh, in a ski resort uh, and we should use it um, to detect where the snowboarders are in a ski resort. But also let's, let's explain what the barometer is. It's a sensor that uh, measures the atmospheric pressure and because the atmospheric pressure changes with the altitude, it can measure changes in the altitude. But it won't tell you that you're at a thousand meters above the sea level, but it will only give you the relative altitude, right? So it will tell you that you just climbed 10 meters, for example. And it's, it's really accurate. It can detect changes of even one meter. So we had this idea that we should use it uh, to detect where the snowboarders are in a ski resort. But to do that, we had to go and collect some data. So actually, in March this year, I went to Lars here for my snowboarding holidays, and I had application for sampling barometer data. But uh, before that, Dom, can you explain us how moving around the ski resort actually works? Sure. I, let's start with this. I think it's important that we all understand how it works and everybody here is familiar with snowboarding. So what you see here is a map of a ski resort. And the black straight lines are the ski lifts and you use them to go from the bottom of the mountain to the top. Once you're there, uh, you take one of the trails to ski or snowboard down back to the bottom of the mountain and you can see those as a blue, red and black lines with arrows pointing down. And you can't really go just anywhere because it could be dangerous, so you take those trails to go down. And you spend the whole day in that area, right? So you, you go up, you ski down, and you continue doing that. And as you see, the, the trails and the leads, they form a directed graph. So in March this year, I created an application that would sample my uh, atmospheric pressure changes that I was experiencing when working out on the snowboard along with my uh, location data. I was also able to tag the data collected by the application with some string. And it was useful because I could uh, tell to the application whether I was at the bottom of the mountain and using a certain ski lift that is listed uh, here in the application uh, or whether I was on the top and I was exiting the, uh, the lift. So the basic idea was to use core motion and core motion, motion coprocessor uh, on iPhone uh, uh, 6s because this is the first one that had a built-in barometer. 
And I had something called Altitude Tracker, and I just needed to create a CM Altimeter uh, instance. And I also needed to use a background queue on which I would receive the uh, altitude data. So I just needed to call a start relative altitude updates uh, method uh, on a certain queue, and I would get a data and an error, no result, and I'm here. But I was able to process this data uh, in the background. And basically, processing was just uh, encapsulating this data into another structure and saving it into core data so I could pass uh, the data to them for further processing on the backend side uh, after I returned from my uh, snowboarding holidays. And the CM altitude data that we are giving when tracking, once, uh, when tracking updates about relative altitude changes uh, contains data about uh, relative altitude change. So with first reading, we get zero relative altitude change. And every other reading is in correspondence to this first reading. So whenever we go up, the altitude would increase. Whenever we go down, this value would decrease. We also get uh, atmospheric pressure measured by our device, uh, probably date. And uh, it was enough for us uh, to use it to locate a snowboarder. So Dom was given uh, tuple of CM altitude data and CL location data encapsulated in a different uh, data container. And Dom, based on the data, can we detect travel by a ski lift by using the data I collected? I, th I think can. <laughs> and let, let's look at the data that Magic collected. And we're really only interested in the barometer readings. And the GPS was only there to help us later understand what's going on. Uh, so we'll plot them in time. So on the vertical axis, you'll see the altitude changes. On the horizontal axis, you'll see the time. And we'll start receiving the barometer readings. And the altitude is decreasing. So Machi must be snowboarding down, because there is no other way in a ski resort to decrease your altitude by that much in such a short time other than snowboarding down the, the, the slope. And then there'll be a part when it gets flat, and the, the line gets flat, and we don't really know what Machi could be doing at the time. Well, I, I know for sure that he must have stopped and made a snowman. And now he must be taking a lift, because we observe that the altitude is increasing. And like, there's not a way, really, to increase your altitude by a couple of hundred meters in such a short time in a ski resort other than taking a lift. And you, you can't really just climb up. You, yeah. And after a short break, much is snowboarding down again. And we're really interested in those parts of the signal that correspond to the lifts. And we want to be able to detect them and to isolate them from that whole signal. And we did it using a fairly simple technique. We started with, we were just keeping track of last 20 readings, computing uh, average. Uh, altitude change in this window, and when we observe that this average increases above certain threshold, we would assume that Machi started taking a lift, and he is on that lift all the time until we observe that this average becomes negative. So I won't get into too much detail of how that works, but that simple approach worked well on the data that we collected. So Tom, can we guess which lift I was using every day? based on the data and with our algorithms? I think can. And yeah, let, let's look at this. This is a more interesting part, because once we can detect which lift in the ski station it was, we know the approximate location of a snowboarder. So first, let's talk about lifts. And there are different type of ski lifts. So what you see here is a chair lift. And that's another chair lift that you can actually find in Singapore. Um, this one is called a gondola lift, and they're usually much faster than chair lifts. And that's another gondola lift that you can also see in Singapore, here in, near to Vivo City. So all those lifts are different, right? They operate at different speeds, they have different technologies, they have different lengths, different changes in the altitude. So let's try to come up with some metrics that could describe those lifts. So we take that signal that we previously isolated from, from the, all the readings. And 
let's try to come up with some metrics, right? And the two th most obvious ones that I can just think straight away would be the total change in the altitude and the travel time. So think of it this way. If you take the same leaf twice, you would expect that you would travel more or less the same time and you will change your altitude by the same amount, right? But you can compute many more. We could compute uh, standard deviation of those changes. We could, if you know signal processing, we can come up with some measures of that signal and yeah, basically anything you can come up with that would describe that signal. And in machine learning, those things are called features and we will use them later to classify uh, our leads. And we computed them for all the signals that Machi collected during his trip. And then I will show you what we did. We, we picked three of those and we plotted them in a three-dimensional scatter plot. And this is how it looks like. And colors represent leaves, right? So if we took the same leaf three times, you would see three points of the same color. And what we observe here is that they form quite nice compact groups, clusters, right? And this will be part of our database. This will go inside the app. So now imagine someone is snowboarding, is using our app, uh, and using the method I described bef before, we extract, we detect that they're taking a lift. Then we compute the same three metrics from this new signal, and we add a new point to this plot. And then we'll see where this new point is, like which, which is the group that's the most, that's the closest to this new point. And best, based on this, we will try to guess which lift it is. And because of that, we'll know where the snowboarder is. So the method I described is known as a nearest neighbor classifier in machine learning. And unfortunately, we do not have enough data to, to, to evaluate the model because we, we only collected like 40 signals and there's a lot of lifts in a ski resort. But just by looking at this, uh, this plot, we hope it could work well. And later, we could further improve the accuracy of, the, of this prediction using ski resort topology because, as I said before, it forms a directed graph, right? So certain paths don't exist in that graph. So, for example, if if you took that lift on the right, there is no path that would bring you all the way to the left directly, so you cannot just use the lifts on the left after you took the lift on the right. Um, yeah. So, so that to sum up my part, and we try to use barometer to then it's, it's a low energy sensor and it only gives you changes in the altitude, but we manage in certain situation, you can manage to approximate someone's location and you can use it as a location service. Good, so if we wanted just to locate a person in our application uh, on iOS, we can use uh, three frameworks, uh, such as core location, core telephony, and core motion. And what we can do with them is we can request a one-time update location, for example, to inform search and rescue services about an emergency that happened in a certain location uh, in a YT application. Uh, we can also continuously track one's location to uh, get an idea of to, to what places he went or to have a track of his workout. We also can monitor entrances and exits from certain and to certain uh, geographical regions uh, or iBeacon regions. We can also tap into CL visits monitoring API uh, on core location. We can get the country that somebody currently resides in by using core telephony and city carrier object. And we can obtain altitude changes uh, based on barometer readings. And before I skip to the next slide, because we are heading to the party and I really want uh, this to have an audio output, could I ask a person to help me out with audio? Mm -hmm. 
hopefully to work. Let's see. It still says that I cannot increase or decrease the volume. Uh, yes, we should be playing. Okay, good. So I wanted to finish this presentation with the last statement. You know, I'm not such a bad snowboarder. So let's rewind this movie a bit. If it can rewind, it cannot. No, damn. Damn. <laughs> OK, let's rewind again. No sound. That's a pity. However, I fell down with my snowboard. But then I immediately stood up and right, <laughs> rode down the slope. OK, so uh, it's everything we prepared for today. So thank you very much. And we'll be posting an article about our trip to La Rosière very soon on the blog. Uh, so let's visit us. Thank you very much.